stream is uh, gone live. Okay. okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, Hamcation special edition. Uh, this is the webinar for building a mesh mobile tower fleet uh, hosted by uh, Eric uh, Westgard, uh, W, uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, 9Y. Uh, NY9D, it's a tongue twister. Yep, yeah, little tongue twister there. Uh, Eric chairs the medical communications for the Medtronic uh, Twin Cities Marathon. And uh, so and we're pleased that he's uh, making his time available for this. So, um, and let's see, we, uh, we're pleased that we'll have a Q&A activities along the way here, and I'll try to manage it, uh, moderate that uh, through the presentation. Uh, I think we will start off with the mics muted, but if I start seeing hands raised, I'll turn around and unmute you, and we'll be able to answer, uh, ask questions on to uh, Eric during the presentation, and then we'll also have some wrap-up towards the end for some uh, questions along the way there. Uh, I will have to note that the webinar, we will have to wrap up about uh, 10.50 to uh, wrap up the presentation and make uh, time for the next webinar that follows this. But um, Eric uh, will lead off with his uh, email. And if you have a questions additionally uh, at the conclusion of this and we're not able to fit it in at the time I have to conclude the webinar, uh, please email your questions to, to Eric uh, along the way there. Uh, this webinar is also being live streamed on YouTube and uh, you're being recorded for later viewing. I will uh, turn around and momentarily post the link uh, for the YouTubes. Uh, you can find some of that information up on the uh, Hamcation website at www.hamcation.com. Um, and uh, just uh, so you know, your camera does not need to be on or your microphone and your microphone will start off muted. Uh, if there's any special need, we'll turn around and turn your microphone on temporarily. Uh, so. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Eric and we will start the uh, webinar for the Build a, a Mesh Mobile Tower Fleet. Uh, Mike, can I jump in here real quick? We still need to play that ad here at the beginning of the, of yeah, the video. Yeah, let's get his ad going. Please okay. do. Okay, so let me, let me do that real quick. Hi there, Anthony here at Gigaparts. Wanted to tell you all about the amazing radios that we offer here at Gigaparts, offering power supplies and other accessories. Gigaparts also carries refurbished computers from names that you know and trust, such as Dell, Lenovo, and HP. <laughs> they make excellent ham shack PCs. We carry 3D printers, filament. We also have amazing zero PCs. PCs with zero bloatware, zero compromises, and zero worries. If you're curious what else we stock, be sure to visit us at gigaparts.com. Okay, hopefully the audio came through okay on that. Yeah, that was great. Yes, it did. All right, and with that, please carry on. Okay, it's Eric, NY90, and let's get started here. Uh, hopefully. Okay, everybody see this okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so um, good morning and thanks for being here. I was hoping to be in Orlando. It's currently 10 degrees below zero Fahrenheit here in Minneapolis. So it's a little cold and you guys have a hammer lock on good weather uh, down there this time of year. So uh, I'm Eric in my ID. I uh, support the uh, Medtronic Twin Cities Marathon, uh, which is our, our signature event. And then also the Red, White and Boom Half Marathon and the Lopet City of Lakes Winter Festival. And uh, so those are a couple of our public service events. And I'm gonna do this talk backwards. I'm gonna talk about the public service slash served agency use case. Then I'm gonna talk about the technology and then we're gonna talk about how we solved it. Normally these talks, you do the technology first and they say, gee, I wonder if we can use it. So a little bit, uh, a little bit backwards. I'm gonna go kind of fast, but uh, blast in with uh, questions and uh, we'll try and answer them. So a little bit about the Twin Cities Marathon uh, medical communications. Um, we're about the number eight marathon in the United States, about 250,000 spectators back in the day, about 30,000 uh, runners on race day, on, on race Sunday. We bring about 100 hams to the event. And I work for the medical director and we run the medical command center. So um, we've got hams out at the water stops. Uh, we've got uh, hams in the medical tent doing check-in and check-out. Uh, we've got a database that we built 
and we use uh, MASH and VSTAR to bring in reports of down runners, injured runners, and in situations to the data trailer, which in turn provides feeds to the Family Medical Information Center. So we do a lot of uh, missing persons, family unification, and really our claim to fame is the race director or the board president comes charging into our tent. So look, what's going on at mile 16, we know. We've got people out there, trusted people, we radio it in, and we've got a database that keeps track of, of incidents. Now we don't do anything with HIPAA, that's a, different, that's a different department, but we do keep track of kind of situational awareness. And then when families come to the family medical fence, saying, where's my mom, are they dead? You know, they were supposed to finish an hour ago, we go, hey look, your mom uh, you know, stopped at an aid station at mile 12, got on a bus, and if you walk one block north, your mom will be there in 12 minutes and you can, you can talk to her. So that's what we do uh, there. Uh, we've got 300 rented UHF radios. We have net controls on those uh, 12 different radio channels. And we've been using MASH for this since uh, about, well, we've been doing actually 11 years that uh, we've been using uh, MASH. So other duties and roles, uh, we drive medical carts. Uh, we manage a, a large group of about 80 student EMTs. We keep track of hospital capacity management. So lots of other duties that we perform uh, really beyond the sort of traditional ham radio uh, backup communications uh, role. So we wrote a database for this. And this is, I think, pretty unique in ham radio. Um, we wrote it, it's in uh, uh, Postgres QL and uh, Essentially, the, the marathon hands us a, a spreadsheet of their participant. We load it into the database, then we can query it, and then we just do updates. So we can say, you know, got on a bus, got off the bus, entered the medical tent, left the medical tent. We also have a messaging system, and we're, uh, Peter, um, KD8GBL, is working on a little dashboard here, and we can keep track of things like med tent capacity uh, that the doctors and the, the race officials or the senior race officials are, are looking for. So this is something that we, uh, we wrote. And it's kind of based on the old uh, ARIES data format. And it's non hip it's just location. Someone has a medical condition, we don't want to know about it. Now the doctors, uh, we've got the medical team's about 200 uh, physicians, nurses, EMTs, physical therapists, the whole team they are used to a, an electronic practice management, you know, position order entry kind of model. There's a lot of real-time decision-making. You know, someone out at mile 16 has a temperature of 104, is that heat stroke? Do you transport, do you cool them? Uh, you know, throw an ice towel on them? What are, you know, there's a lot of kind of real-time things that happen medical-wise. And you might have someone who's, for example, a pathologist who is out there in a sports medicine role and says, look, I want, higher authority to weigh in in real time. So that's why they built this dashboard system. And it runs on uh, mobile devices. And we were put in charge of training folks on this and we're allowed to use it. And we've been trying to integrate this cloud-based system with our database, with APIs. And that's been a kind of an ongoing battle. But I think the other events are getting in the game with us and saying, look, we need an integrated view for situa situational awareness of what's happening out there on the, uh, on the race course. And I think this is really leading. This is a picture of Winston Churchill's World War II war room. Uh, you know, pick a date, 1943. Notice um, we've got the written message traffic uh, folders. We've got the telephones and then there's a map. And Winston Churchill never had, never went anywhere during the war without his portable map room. So he did things visually. And if you look at what's happening with COVID-19 is that's all real-time data in dashboard. And this is what we're hearing from our served agencies. There's a big shift away from formal written message traffic toward, toward graphics, dashboarding, you know, being able to zoom in on data. And that's what they're asking for um, as well as video. So I'm calling this the database and dashboard gap. And this is also driving a change in how we deliver emergency communications and event communications. So they want dashboards, databases, and video. Uh, my friend Steve Hartman, who's a very senior leader in the Red Cross, keeps telling me, Eric, better data, better decision. You know, he's got, you know, sometimes million dollar budgets for disaster relief. And you know, where do you spend the money? Where do you need the aid stations? You know, where is the, the greatest need for the people? And that's real-time data, that's databases. 
And the Red Cross, in fact, has a new cloud database called RC Care that keeps track of who they're caring for. So we've deployed MASH again more than 10 years using low cost outdoor rated Wi Fi hardware. It has a very short tactical range, and um, uh, we've been uh, pestering uh, Minnesota Aries to, to, to focus in on some standards and, and pick some standard channels uh, for that. So, uh, again, about uh, 10 years ago, as it started, yeah, production since 2011, we built our own mesh backbone. And we had the intuitive feeling this would need to be part 15. Um, one of our big partners in here, the Hennepin County Sheriff's Department, wants to use it for law enforcement and hostage rescues and negotiations. And one of our hospitals, I looked them in the eye and said, I need help. And they go, is this going to require ham radio operators? Is a ham radio only network? I looked them in the eye and said, no. And I said, okay, here's, you know, here's the guy to call. And they agreed to participate. And um, we, that's been a good decision for us. However, I've, it's caused what I call the revolt of the commels. I get a call once a week saying, Eric, this isn't ham radio. This is commercial. What are you doing? You know, this isn't part 87, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I get a lot of static on this, but we've been very happy we did this uh, with, uh, with part 15 on now uh, five gigahertz. So the architecture that we built. You know, starts up, for example, um, our marathon, uh, the start is in Minneapolis, the finish is in St. Paul, the state capital grounds, that's about nine point miles away, 9.1 miles away. So we can uplink video from one of our command trucks or a portable camera up to the backbone, across a dish network uh, between the, 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 um, the two downtowns and then back down in this case, we're looking at the data at uh, fire station number four in St. Paul. And, um, uh, we can put cameras out there. We can put phones out there. We've got you know, our database uh, lives um, out on the uh, out on the mesh. And in fact, the marathon a couple of years ago, the race director said, "Look, you know, the starts in Minneapolis. We'd like live video, and one of our jobs is to provide backup communications and not use the standard, you know, cellular or government radio system to be essentially a third leg of the stool of backup uh, communications." So this is live video showing uh, one of our favorite vehicles, the Hennepin County Sheriff Incident Command Center, which has a bunch of our mesh antennas on it in Minneapolis, uh, right at this near the, where the start line is. And I uh, did a screen capture of this uh, from over in St. Paul at the, uh, in the fire station uh, parking lot. So we get a lot of people saying, you know, okay, this is all fine. You got this mesh, you got this video, what do you use it for? This is the, uh, the Klondike Dark Derby. Uh, this was uh, on a 15,000 acre lake called Lake Minnetonka. It's like about a mm, 40 kilometer course and it's dog sleds. And this is uh, from the ICC, the Incident Command Center truck with our mesh cameras. And they've got a pan tilt zoom camera. And um, in fact, right about when this picture was taken, there was a problem with one of the sled dog teams. Uh, it's got a harness or something. And they were able to zoom in and again, stream live to video so all the sheriff's people and the participants can see, oh, there's a problem with the harness for the third dog and they're fixing it. You know, again, situational awareness live um, from out on the course using our, our mesh technology on a very large uh, urban, uh, or urban lake. So I got a call, I uh, did an event down in Orlando called NCS4, the Invitation Marathon. We did a medical marathon panel, met all the big marathons. The guy from the City of Lakes Wilpet Winter Festival was there and said, hey, we could use hams. We, you know, I've never heard of them. They've never heard of us. So we got together. It's an urban ski race, 7,000 or so skiers and fat tire bikes, 42 kilometer course and the headquarters in a battle. Now, if you're from Minnesota, looking at the hill behind you, you know, that's a hill. <laughs> if you're from Colorado, this is the funniest thing you ever saw, but, you know, could cause problems. I felt we needed a tower trailer. And we have two that we've had for years. One was frozen in 200 yards from the nearest road. The other was um, stuck in a um, uh, storage barn full of motor homes and boats. And I did request from a certain local government agency uh, and they said, no, you know, you're not a government agency, essentially go away. So I was kind of stuck. So when I'm stuck, I go shopping online and uh, did a search online for tower trailer and somehow Google or one of the engines came back with light tower. So these are uh, generally have 30 foot steel towers. They're used at construction sites for lighting up. You know, if you see them, you know, working on a bridge at two in the morning or, you know, trying to finish a highway project in the dark, that's what these are used for. So the vision here was, 
you know, 30 foot steel tower, uh, some group 27 batteries, some solar panels, our mesh antennas, uh, you know, some, you know, two meter 440 antennas. And we thought, you know, what can go wrong with a cute little six kilowatt diesel engine? You know, how, how hard can that be to fix? So, um, and uh, the place we found a bunch of these is on our website called www.ironplanet.com. And it's sort of a big kind of a wholesale uh, market. And there's a lot of rental return uh, units out there. So we, uh, this was kind of the vision. And this was, uh, again, last uh, February. And the poor thing, I needed a bath. I rolled it out in the driveway uh, when we had a little bit of a warm spell and it was really uh, dirty. So we had the one, we started playing with it. and. Um, just had a ball and said, you know, if we have one, we probably ought to have two. So we found another one that was over in Wisconsin, big yellow one, uh, a lot bigger than I thought it was. Has a um, Lister Petter uh, diesel, again, uh, three cylinder, about 15 horsepower, 12 horsepower. Yeah, what can go wrong, right? We knew about injection pumps and glow plugs and we're watching all these YouTube videos. And um, finally, uh, a couple months into this, my wife is like, you know, I used to be an accountant. She said, I looked at the uh, credit card bill and uh, yeah, you bought it for 500 bucks, but the, uh, you know, the total is uh, more than 1500 Look at all the parts. And why don't you guys just buy the fixed one? So we've been kind of going back and forth on that. And, you know, it was a little bit of a struggle uh, over the winter. Uh, the short answer is when you buy a broken one, it's usually pretty broken. Like, you know, burned out cylinders or bad main bearings. And, you know, if the, the, Equipment rental place, and this is what they do is have equipment. If they gave up on it, it's probably a, a good a good reason. So June 2020, we had our kind of coming out party. We had our little debutante event. Uh, it was kind of funny. I called the um, uh, our local field day group, uh, the St. Paul Radio Club and the um, Mining Radio Club and said, hey, uh, what are you doing for field day? And can I bring a tower trailer? And they go, you know, who's in charge? They said, well, yeah, we're kind of not having field day, and you're in charge of power. Oh, all right. So I brought both of them. So the orange one got a coat of paint, my cute code name. Orange is the new black. I can't use that publicly because it's a trademark or a, you know it's a licensed thing, but it used to be orange and now it's black. And uh, Doug talked me into putting a six meter beam on it, and then we put a full size tribander on the yellow one, which never got a name, and we parked them 115 feet apart, and we put a G5 RV between. Them. And he set up in about 20 minutes. And you know, the, the few folks that were there were impressed. And they said, well, this is kind of cool. And uh, we decided the broken generators were good ballast, right? If you're going to put a tri-bander at 30 feet or 35 feet, you need something kind of sturdy to hold it up. And we ended up with a bunch of dipoles tied on these. And I think it was a good, uh, a good impression was made at, uh, at field day. So we. Uh, you know, through the power of uh, boredom and online shopping, acquired a few more. Uh, like now we're up to 13 as of uh, yesterday. So um, one of the big auction houses, Richie Brothers, was having an auction on five of them, which strangely had the engines removed and had radio antennas on them. And these were going for like 200 bucks because the construction companies didn't want them. So the guys bought at least five in that auction. And then... Uh, we staged the scene uh, of, of the units in convoy. I stole this from the uh, Cajun Navy Relief who has this bass boat armada, which has captured the national uh, media attention. And then the center in the bottom is uh, one called Dice. And I bought this at an auction in uh, Southern Minnesota. It was uh, stuck in a snowbank, And um, uh, I just literally dragged it home from the auction on Tuesday and brought it to Hams in the Park on Saturday. And there's really nothing else going on. The guy from Minnesota Boad walks over and goes, oh, Doug uh, loaned me a um, little uh, 40 meter dipole. He got it at a state sale and somebody had a radio and we were making uh, perks on the air contacts. And uh, I said, boy, this is something we can use. So we literally now have an MOU, a signed MOU with uh, Minnesota Boad for the tower fleet. Uh, the one on the left is uh, called Big White, and that one um, had a broken diesel, and it was pretty cheap, and that's going to go in our loaner uh, pool. And then uh, on the right is uh, uh, Orange is the New Black. We've got our famous uh, towing flags at the uh, Lopet uh, Winter, uh, Winter Festival. So the current status of the tower fleet as of essentially right now, um, this was uh, Hams of the Park in, uh, in July. So Orange is the New Black on the left. 
Uh, we've got the part 15 mesh antennas. Again, we picked five gigahertz because it's not congested. Um, we found that the Marathon 2.4 was hopeless. All the cell phones are looking for Wi-Fi and it, it was the noise floor was just ridiculous. So um, we picked five gigahertz. Um, we decided to go all in on Arden. So we've got all the Arden uh, mesh equipment on the towers and this has solved the revolt of the comels who now you know can, i said yeah we're supporting oh great supporting art we're good and then uh, pan tilt zoom cameras um and then the lights are interesting i took the lights off of uh, the first one because i you know i didn't think we needed them I, whatever well then you know in the middle of summer we had a big storm tree was knocked down blocked the road knocked out the power and i said oh Things happen in the dark. So um, the lights, the average light on one of these light towers is 100,000 lumens, lights about an acre. And so I decided to keep the lights, and I'm actually putting lights back on the whole fleet, uh, just something we can use. Because, you know, public service events go on at two in the morning, right? And you need some light. Uh, we started buying these cheap uh, propane generators. Our favorite right now are the Sportsman 4000 DFs. They're about 250 bucks on eBay. They're noisy, um, but they're cheap and they run on propane. You can get propane anywhere and at propane stores, unlike a gas one. And they're about three and a half kilowatts. Uh, again, I like a sturdy pipe mount on these for mounting things like tribanders or big antennas of various kinds. Um, the one on the left now has a repeater uh, in it and we tried it out. Um, and then um, two gig Arden, the guys, the Arden guys are all excited about two gigahertz. I'm like, fine, you know, that's a $30 radio. We just add it to this collection. And the one on the right actually has a running diesel. And I've been obsessed by the diesels um, just because you roll into a disaster scene and you've got six kilowatts of diesel and 30 gallons of fuel, and you're probably good for 20, 25 hours. Um, diesel stores pretty well. I get very excited about having all this power, but we haven't found a use case for the power. So, um, and, and we've kind of decided we have kind of two flavors of trailers. We have the power trailers, and then we have the you know the ones, and we took the diesel out of Orange is the New Black. I couldn't fix it. Um, and it has a 10 new uh, cabin inside for repeaters. And so, um, you know, we can have power power trailers and repeater trailers, and most of them have uh, solar panels as well, which will run the uh, you know run the mesh antennas and will run the uh, you know the cameras and stuff. But if you need something big like you know a field day radio or a repeater. Then you're probably going to have to, uh, to fire up some uh, generators. And our events, of course, give us a uh, short power. So we're putting uh, 20 amp uh, marine uh, short power chargers in these. So you know, if, if we're at like the marathon always says, you know, here's a here's a plug from our uh, our generator fleet. Um, we can just uh, plug in and run the uh, run the power off of those. And then we've got some swanky uh, call sign decal uh, as well. And then notice the the funky colors and more on that in a minute. So, uh, you know, we keep getting calls. What's the use case? So the marathon back in October said, uh, I asked them if we could use their parking lot to set up a trailer. And my nightmare was all these hams would show up and give each other COVID, but they did. We kept it quiet. And we got 17 check-ins from the trailer on Simplex uh, around uh, several counties. So I think this validates the, you know, the theoretical uh, kind of 10 mile range uh, that you would get from an antenna at, uh, and again, Tim's is up at, you know, 30 plus six, you know, 36 feet or so for a, uh, you know, kind of like a, uh, you know, GP6, GP9 kind of a, a kind of an antenna. And then I put a call into my friends at the Lopet Winter Festival and said, you know, very gently said, hey, what's going on? You know, all these events are getting canceled. And, you know, and they said, well, you know, we're just, you know, barely getting started and, you know, the health department's on the phone and, you know, a couple hundred participants and a delayed start. And I said, well, do you need a medical command center? They're like, no. So we're going to just have a couple of medics and very limited setup. And I said, you know, I've been playing around with video. And, and my boss at the Lobo, it's like, I'm clearing my calendar. I want video. Because if I have video, my participants, sorry, my, my spectators will stay home and not give each other COVID. And we can do these events again. You know, if we can keep everybody safe, we're good. So um, he wanted cameras in a bunch of places. I put the word out. We brought in uh, two power trailers. So Orange is the New Black here is at the finish line. And then uh, uh, Pete Six Pack, we deployed down at Worth Lake, which is about a mile away behind a couple of hills. And the theory was we could have multiple cameras and then streamed over YouTube. So that was the idea. So uh, 
uh, Peter uh, Corbett uh, whipped up a, um, a platform using uh, uh, OBS, I think it's called Open Broadcast Software. And uh, we brought a couple of ice fishing tents, in fact, you can see, and then on the event ended up getting uh, donated a little tiny trailer. And we uh, literally streamed about 15 hours of a live video to YouTube. Now, you could make the argument this isn't ham radio, but the event was eternally grateful. And they, in fact, all they talk about now is power trailers and how many do you have and where you're bringing them. And then um, they created a new department for us, communications and video. So um, I think this was a very uh, successful event. Uh, the second weekend, we got frozen out. It was uh, below zero and uh, too cold to uh, ski. So I get these calls all the time. I get a call a week from a commel saying, look, Eric, this isn't ham radio. You know, I don't see any formal message traffic. I don't see Winlink here. You know, what do you think you're doing? I said, well, I'm, you know, buying stuff at surplus auctions. So here's a little white, which is trailer number 11, uh, which somehow ended up at my house. 425 bucks, um, hit a Lamborghini, 27 horse, it's called a Folks diesel, uh, six kilowatt generator, 30 foot tower. So we got down there and well, <laughs> If you buy stuff from a cement company, it's going to have some cement dust. You need some tires. Um, it had the famous Pinto hitch. And then uh, you can actually see the broken uh, trailer wiring. Um, uh, I, it was getting really cold here, and I checked the coolant. And while well, there wasn't any, that's a problem. Uh, the key was tricky. But at the end of the day, we've got a running diesel and 45 amp alternator. Now, the generator's got two bad main, main windings. That's going to be tricky. Uh, we've got mesh antennas and a Group 24 marine battery. And that's not bad for a little over 400 bucks. So we've been having some fun with this. I, I would argue this is ham radio. Um, there are those who would disagree, but, you know, happy to have that debate. So we made some silly rules. We've had some run-ins. I've personally had some run-ins with uh, the emergency management folks who think we're trying to impersonate them. Uh, so um, I'm, the trailers are getting cute tactical names and colors. My vision for the trailers was the paint job. If I'm familiar with the, the cartoon series Scooby-Doo and the, I think it was called the Mystery Machine. So we're talking about, um, you know, purple. We're talking green. Um, I'm trying to keep the kids away from the painting needs because there's some lead paint and it's, uh, you know, but, you know, have your kids name them, have your kids design the paint jobs. Um, and I think, you know, the idea is this is ham radio. This is not, you know, we're not from the government uh, here. And then we test them with our local mesh standards. The idea is everybody wants to do their own thing. Uh, we're picking our own channels. But, you know, the thing about mesh is there's power in multitude. You know, if everybody has trailers and you can show up at an event and, you know, build a mesh that covers a big lake or a park or a disaster scene, that's value. If everybody's kind of off in their own corner doing their own thing, that isn't good. And then, I'm starting to use this notion of 20-minute uh, standby and 20-minute warm standby. And a lot of people have, you know, a whole garage full of junk right at their house, but these need to roll in 20 minutes. And that's a big mindset change for him. Uh, and then the idea is, uh, you know, we're really like the, the bass boat armada from the Cajun Navy. And then, you know, let's not take this too seriously. So things like, you know, is it a barbecue? Yeah. Can you put a beverage cooler on it? Sure. So that's uh, something we're, uh, we're thinking about. And then kind of a commercial for what I think is happening with amateur radio public service in 2021. And I've you know, been on the horn with Paul Gilbert and I've spent some time with our new uh, CEO at the league. I think this notion of waiting around for the government radio systems to fail is kind of boring. And I think we need to be really embedded in agencies. So you know, different relief organizations, EMS, these are big events. We got to get in the dashboard business and we have to talk about our capabilities, missing persons, family reunification, weather spotting, video. A uh, big thing I'm hearing from my local leaders in the BOAD space is this, this notion of crisis cleanup. So, you know, dealing with, you know, blue tarps on roofs and mucking out basements. I mean, this is not super sexy, but it's a space that we can kind of own. I do think we need to get back to having some assets. Um, go kits are unpopular now with our large sporting events. Um, you know, if you show up at a marathon with a black backpack, uh, they're not going to be happy to see you. Um, and then this notion of ham radio licenses valid credential. And I'm talking with Paul Gilbert about this. We have a problem about 20% of the ham licenses don't have valid addresses. We got to fix that. Uh, and then this notion of unwanted volunteers, and I am a big fan of unwanted volunteers and want to have as many as uh, possible uh, helping us out. 
So with that, that's the slides. I kind of blasted through them. Uh, I don't know if we're getting, um, uh, Mike, any uh, any questions or anything. I, I sort of blasted through it. Uh, so far, I haven't seen any questions come through yet. But uh, if people do have questions, please raise your hand and I will uh, set you up to so you can unmute yourself. Eric, what I would suggest is, can we uh, get your email out there in case there are questions that come up at, at a later time that people want to ask too? Let's see. Oh, let's see. I do. Uh, a couple questions are starting to come in now. Perfect. Okay. Um, first one is: any issues with RF noise from the generators? Okay. Super good question. The question is RF noise. So from the diesels, the diesels have nothing electrical in them. I mean, literally there's the starter. There is no ignition for ignition noise. Um, the generators themselves are astonishingly simple, uh, but we really haven't tested it. So I would say the diesels, no. Uh, <laughs> the little gasoline ones are, 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 sorry, the dual fuel ones are a different story. Those seem to be sort of noisy. But I think the answer to that is no, especially the diesel. They are literally, there is no, the diesels have no electrical system other than the starter. And the fuel pump, which actually a lot of times the fuel pumps are mechanical, so no. Okay. Uh, next one is, how are you using D Star now? Okay, good question. So, years ago, I can actually bounce up a couple of slides. Years ago, we started out with D Star DD mode, and that was because our apps. Well, this is our app. Our app was web based, and the DD mode had just enough bandwidth that we were able to get in, um, let's see here. So we were able to get in all the net controls could be on DD mode, the medical tent could be on DD mode, family medical, and we were able to get in, all get into the database across the whole Twin Cities. Well, we've switched that over to Mesh now. And so DSTAR has gone into essentially a backup role um, behind Mesh. Now, DSTAR has one important advantage. You stick a 1.2 gigahertz antenna in the air and if your other end is 12 miles away, you can reach it. So it has astonishingly good range. It does support web apps, things like uh, you know our, our little database. So for that reason, we've kept it around, but it's kind of in a in a park and monitor mode, uh, and it, it is, it's essentially a backup uh, system. If that makes sense. Okay. Uh, next question is, what brand of mesh antennas do you use and are they POE? Good question. So the mesh equipment, we're using Ubiquity. And uh, Ubiquity, there's, I think I had a slide in which I took out, I thought I was going to run out of time. Uh, so we're using nano stations and we're using um, uh, rockets and bullets. In fact, um, I'm trying to think if I have one in, in front of me here. And they, what you want is you want the right ubiquity equipment to run the software. Now we do our own um, open work and uh, OLSR software. Peter does that for us. You know, we built our own. It, it, it looks a lot like the DSTAR network at slash 24s, but essentially the equipment that's on the uh, the Arden list is good for that. And yeah, we love the, the, the other advantage of the, um, older ubiquity equipment, the rockets, the bullets, uh, some of the dishes, is they will run happily, don't tell anybody, this is a secret, on 12 volt PoE. So you can buy the little uh, the little PoE adapters for uh, five bucks on eBay and um, uh, the radios are happy on 12 volt. So those are some advantages and we love the ubiquity stuff. We haven't had any of it fail and it uh, is happy to be outdoors and we use the little ubiquity um, uh, I think I think I've got a picture of uh, oranges and black. We also use the um, nano switches, and, and the nano switches. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can see on on the left hand side on on oranges the new black. That's a we've got a bullet, and then the bottom one is a nano switch and another bullet, uh, and those provide four PoE ports. So I can run one cat five up the tower and I can power uh, two mesh radios. And I usually plug the, the pan tilt zoom camera to a third port, but the pan tilt zoom cameras normally need that 12 volt power uh, by themselves or 
the sort of the new quote unquote standard 48 volt PoE. And that's sort of a nuisance on a trailer because you have to step up the voltage up to 48. Okay, I think along the same lines, we had a question on, do you use the, I'll probably uh, mispronounce it, Arian, A-R-E-D-N for the mesh network? Yeah, Arden is, so, so yeah, that's a good question. So we started out with part 15, our, our part 15, we've called it the Twinsland Medical Command Network is part 15. We get just tons of pushback and, you know, angry calls, all kinds of people are really upset. But actually one of the reasons we liked it is that the deal, in fact, just like this, the deal we did for the, the Lofa Winter Festival, they had commercial sponsors on the broadcast that we were doing. So we can use our part 15 network for commercial use. We can send HIPAA data over it. We can do, you know, whatever our, you know, hostage negotiations, whatever. But we've told everybody right, the ham radio standard in Minnesota is AREDN or ARD. And there's a couple of folks in uh, in areas that are running that. And we, you know, we, we're using, um, I think it's minus two in channel 180. And it's real plug and play uh, and it's easy. So um, we, we run both on the trailers. And then we're adding both to our, our, uh, our backbone site. And we're not connecting them together. So the idea is, you know, the ham radio stuff stays on ham radio and I don't have to tell the hospital, oh yeah, the stuff we put in your hospital, it's connected to 180 hams home networks. And how cool is that? You know, if you're a hospital IT director, you're gonna lose your mind over that for security issues. But this way they're air gapped. And it's like our, our, our part 15 network is connected to nothing. It's, it's air gapped. And then the Arden is air gapped. And then, um, you know, never the twain uh, shall meet. Okay. Uh, next one is who pays for all the equipment? Uh, that would be us. So I'm mentioning the, uh, the how cheap stuff is. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> and again, it, it, it's like the old story about a ship and the rigging. You know, these, again, so these two trailers, the one on the left cost 700 bucks. The one on the right was 500 bucks. Had to go to Fargo to get it. Now, how much have we spent in repairs, parts, et cetera? Only my wife knows for sure. And the answer is it's quite a bit, you know, once you get through the, you know, adding all the doodads and new tires and all that sort of thing, but they're, they're not ridiculous expensive. I'd say, you know, if you have a budget of, you know, 1500 bucks, you're probably good to go. And where do you find the light pole trailers? So there's a bunch of online auctions. Again, our favorite auction site is Iron Planet and www.ironplanet.com. Uh, probably the second favorite one is one called Equipment Fact. And uh, probably my third favorite right now is um, uh, one called Purple Wave. And you wanna search for the cheap ones or the ones that say inoperative, or if there's ever a picture where the lights aren't on, that's a code name for the generator's probably broken and the broken ones are cheaper. Now, if you want one with a working generator, um, then you probably have to pay more. But Iron Planet is our, is our favorite, uh, favorite website. And then they, they have a division called Richie Brothers that does auctions. But again, most of these, you can bring a credit card and um, uh, you, know, you can just buy them from, your, uh, from the comfort of your uh, living room. And all the parts for these are, are off the shelf. I mean, seriously, the I probably have bought, I don't know, 15 trailer jacks with the little handles on them. And those are you know, $27 at, at Harbor Freight. You know, the hitches are standard, the tires are standard, the, you know, uh, the winch cables, you can find them. So the, you know, sort of 95% of the parts are something you can get at the local auto supply store. The bearings are standard. Uh, so a lot of the repairs are done, you know, to the to the running gear on the towers are standard. Um, uh, the diesels it gets a little funky where you have to you know figure out which diesel they have and which parts do you need. And then we've been watching a lot of YouTube videos on the diesel repair, and we haven't been very good at it so far. Okay. Uh, and do the trailers need to be registered with the Department of Motor Vehicle? Yes. Yeah. So. I, for reasons I don't fully understand, you will almost never find one of these registered. So I haven't bought one that's been registered yet. A couple of Tim's had license plates on them. I, 
there's some sort of exemption for you know cement trailers or construction equipment, whatever. So when you buy one at an auction, they will give you a bill of sale and it needs to be signed. Lately, they've been just stamping them and signing them as a notary, but not on the, you know, the seller. It has, it, has to, it has to be a signed bill of sale and that they'll get crabby at you because you brawl at them back. Then you can take that to the DMV and they generally weigh less than 3,000 pounds. So in Minnesota, they don't have to be titled, they have to be registered and they get a little sticker. And um, so I just finished getting the stickers for the rest of mine. And they, you know, they will give you a, a bill of sale, uh, generally at the auctions. And if it's a small auction house, the guy will actually sign it, you know, Bob Smith, you know, and then, and then you can, you can and then you get it registered and then you can insure them. Insurance is cheap, it's like 15 bucks uh, uh, every six months to insure them. But I, I like them to be registered, insured, and then, you know, make sure the lights work and, you know, whatever state regulations you have about trailers, if that makes sense. Okay, we've got several questions on the challenge. What uh, site challenges do you run into? How do you solve them? How, you know, problems working with uh, other uh, ham emergency groups. So, uh, let me comment yeah. on, on that a little. Bit. <laughs> so basically, you know, our thing is we talk to served agencies and give them what they want, and we, you know, recruit our own rank and file and. So we don't really get in debates with them because I, I'm, I don't debate them. I just, we just do our thing and kind of, I don't know, set a good example, if that makes sense. And, you know, and then, you know, the idea is these are a platform. I'm, I'm dictating, I'm telling people about, I want funky code names and cute paint jobs. But, you know, if, if the people in your area are all about formal written, formal written message traffic and art, sure. Right, you know, if that's what they want, give them what they want, and keep them happy. So that's how that's kind of our motto. And I don't it, the debate thing is, you know, that's for you know, that's for the you know the bar afterwards, but not for the you know the public service side of it. So we're trying to take the high road. We've got, we've got um, I, and literally <laughs> we have a second MOU. So they want an MOU with Minnesota area you know, for these. So I think we've been successful in that in that attempt. Yeah, you can see. Okay. Let's see, um, any advice on how to approach local government authority or public safety agencies as an amateur radio emergency co uh, communications organization? Yeah, government agencies are funny. In general, we have not had good luck with them. They there's some bad juju going on and I don't, I, I can't really put my finger other than, you know, they have their mission. And I think we historically have been very, very important to them, but these days, right, they've got, you know, fancy cell phones and they've got fancy radios. And we spend a lot of time telling them no and making demands. And I think it's made them a little crabby. So our philosophy is work with the served agencies, specifically the events, so the marathons, the ski races, the, the events, give them what they want. And then you can also get yourself embedded in the agencies that are actually delivering the service, if that makes sense. So join the Marathon Association, join the YMCA race. You know, and people are going to say, well, that's not ham radio. Well, yeah, you're going to be sweeping parking lots and, you know, you know, directing people to park and doing, you know, non-glamorous activities. But once the organizations like you, then you can sort of gently poke at them and say, oh, you have a medical command center. Do you need one, et cetera? So it, it's, it's more of a duties as assigned get yourself in with it. So, so right now, you know, the, the ham radio is in charge of medical communications at the largest outdoor sporting event in Minnesota. The government is not, we are, that's good. And, and we're, we're, we are, we get a hug every year from the incident commander because we do things their way. We're just like, okay, what do you guys want? How do you want us to do it? Where do you want us to set up? And it's a partnership as opposed to us sort of dictating to them. So it's just being friendly and helpful. And um, I actually went out and registered the domain last week of It's Not Ham Radio. I think that's gonna be our slogan for 2021 is It's Not Ham Radio. Right. We're gonna do things the way that served agencies want it done, not the way we want it done.
Okay. Uh, another question here is uh, what type and brand cameras do you use? And uh, I'll follow that up with software for the cameras too. Oh my God. Yeah. Don't even get me started on cameras. Um, so <laughs> you know, this is, oh, so the only advice I can give you on cameras is there's a standard called ONVIF. And it's, I think it's sort of an industry standard. And what happens is I go out and buy random cameras on eBay and they show up and, and, you know, I give them to Peter and Peter gets them working. And then we're like, okay, that one works great. And then we say, okay, we test it. And then a month later we said, oh, we should go buy five more of those. They're gone. They're discontinued. That model is vanished and they've got a new model. And I'm like, oh, and I don't want to buy five because if I get five and they don't work, I'm stuck with five. So uh, we've been losing our mind. So, so cameras have been a perennial nightmare, but the ONVIF standard seems to be the best. And then we use um, Open Broadcast Studio, OBS. Now, the Hennepin County Sheriff's Department uses something called NS Witness that works for them. Um, OBS has been pretty good for us. It runs on Windows 10, but the, the camera compatibility and the, the RTSP stream thing is, I would use the word challenging, complicated, and fast moving. So um, cameras are, are, what I would do is get yourself some ONVIF uh, camera or two, get the open broadcast studio, figure out the stream IDs, get it working. And then if you can buy a few more cameras well, before they discontinue of the ones that you have. Um, and we like the cameras that have ethernet plugs on them and 12 volt power. There's a, turn, a mood to have like proprietary software and also cameras that have a little website. Uh, and um, there's another piece of software called uh, ONVIA Device Manager. That I think it's Russian. And it sort of sniffs and figures out all the stuff that the, uh, that the cameras do. But yeah, there are, that's a whole, I could go on for a week on, on camera. Uh, another one is, uh, what's the average cost of, uh, of a mesh radio? Uh, we've been paying $24.99, including shipping. And that's for the used 5 gigahertz ubiquity rockets. I think that's the rockets, yeah, the, with the two. And then the antennas are um, $4.99 each. We're poor. We're, we're, we're trailer poor here. Um, a lot of the guys are buying the brand new and the trouble with the brand new radios and people like ubiquity they use signed firmware and it can be very very challenging to get the open work loaded up and so the older ones are actually better if, if that makes sense uh interesting one are your activities having any clout to make an argument with the fcc to protect part of the three gigahertz band for future use, not challenged by sharing with band edges with Wi-Fi. Yeah, the whole three gigahertz thing. So here's the deal. Um, I think mesh is important for ham radio public service in 2021 and beyond. And getting the people to use it and deploy it widely is good. And if we can use you know, and this is kind of the Arden thing. If, if it becomes commonly used and there's you know, hundreds and thousands of cameras and we're using it for stuff, then we have a case. But I think we have to sort of get started using it and then demonstrate to the, you know, it, 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 it's like we have, you know, we can go to the FCC and, and drop the repeater directory on the desk, right? And say, look, we have, you know, in Minnesota, we have you know, hundreds of repeaters. And if we can show a massive use case for using mesh and dashboards and video, um, then I think we've got, uh, until then, you know, it's like, well, why should a couple of hundred hams using moon bounce trump, you know, 5 million people who want to use the broadband, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of the argument that I have. Yeah, let's see, kind of back to the vehicles here a little bit. Do you have vehicles dedicated for refueling or how do you handle topping off the gas, propane or diesel? Super good question. I haven't really thought about it. Um, so the average one, like Jelly Green Generator here has about 30 gallons of diesel on board. Um, the propane bottles are super easy. Um, you just take those to the, um, to, I, 
my theory on the propane bottles, you can just go swap them at any convenience store. And actually field day last year, we burned up a bottle of propane and I went to the place and I want, I have a really old rusty tank and I wanted to swap it. And the guy goes, no, 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 we don't swap tanks. We refill them. So he refilled it. So that's safe and easy. And um, uh, haven't thought about diesel refueling. That's a good question. The one thing you got to watch, and this is a lot of these that you buy, the diesels are blown up. People put gasoline in the diesel that will destroy the engine right away. And avoiding getting gasoline and diesel tanks is a big, 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 big worry and problem. Yeah, good, good question on the refueling. The other thing is if we've got, in fact, the yellow one where the, they still have the fuel tanks but the broken diesels, is we could use these as diesel tankers. To, but the, you got to watch that you don't put the, there's a thing we have here called red dyed, where certain diesel like goes in farm tractors but can't go in vehicles. So there's a lot of legalities around that diesel. Okay. Uh, the next one is, um, is a copy of the presentation available? This yeah. Might... Okay. And can I assume that's available up on your, your website? Yeah, so I'll you... put it up on SlideShare. Our, we our website's a long story, but I'll put it up on uh, SlideShare under my call sign, as well as on my QRZ page, NY90. Okay. And uh, com one comment on the presentation, uh, you mentioned several links to the uh, locations to be able to turn around and find auctions uh, for the, uh, the trailers. Uh, they asked if those could be added to uh, maybe a slide on the back end of your presentation with those links. And uh, one uh, attendee also mentioned uh, Ritchie Brothers Auctions um, is another possible location for uh, finding. Yeah, trailers. I've got, I got one of the links is on this slide and they're, um, they're, Ritchie Brothers is sort of related to um, Iron Planet. I, that somehow they're they're the same and different. So I, we bought from both. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. I think we've. I guess one is where do you tend to store the trailers? Well, super good question. So I think they have to be carefully stored. So if you look at the upper right picture, that's the front of my three car garage, and I've got two in there at the moment. I have four. So a big blizzard came and it got really cold. And I was like, oh my God, which one of my children do I leave out in the driveway? You know, So I got four in there, um, just wedge them in. The newer ones are smaller, the older ones are bigger. Um, but I got four in there and I would say storm in garages are behind fences. You don't wanna get them stolen or vandalized. Um, you wanna kind of keep uh, keep an eye on them. But yeah, in, in garages, you can you know rent storage units, uh, et cetera, but I would, um, uh, keep them uh, safe. But at my, on my lot right now, I have four in the garage and uh, one in the driveway with a cover over it. Oh, and this is another trick. If the neighbors ask, especially the black one, they said, is that a smoker, a uh, barbecue smoker? And the answer is, yes, it is. And you know, it has a propane tank in it. And, you know, worst case, I, I hang a marine barbecue on it. And then there are rules against storing construction equipment in residential lots, but no such rules uh, reply to um, barbecue smokers. Okay. Well, I think, Eric, that uh, about wraps up our questions and wraps up the time we have for your presentation today. So uh, first, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining uh, Hamcation uh, 2021 special event uh, and providing this presentation. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, I hope uh, people turn around and uh, take a look at some of the other forums going on uh, today and uh, tomorrow. So, and again, thank you very much, Eric. Greatly Many appreciate thanks, it. Mike. Thanks for all the help. Okay, you're very welcome. Everyone have a great day and uh, enjoy the rest of Hamcation uh, Special Edition uh, 2021. Thank you.